pop quiz time. If you walk down a street in your hometown, say your downtown, your uh, blinky light district, how many sensing devices do you see? But that's only a tiny fraction of the sensors, right? The ones you don't see under your feet, on the buildings, high in the air, embedded on the traffic light, that will see you only going 10 miles over the speed limit and will probably send you a picture of yourself in the mail, biting your nails, because you were almost certain you were getting a ticket that day. Dang it. <laughs> Kind of reminds me of those guess how many jelly beans in a jar games when I was a kid. Unless you were like me and counted every bean around the edge per line. Square that and divide by 4 pi to get the area of one layer. Multiply that by the number of vertical layers and adjust for the tiny curvy parts at the top and the bottom of the jar. Wait, this is an electronic engineering broadcast. You were totally like me, weren't you? <laughs> okay, so getting back to those ubiquitous sensors. With all of these sensors, like jelly beans in a jar, there are way too many to count. But in order for them to exist in the first place, with their battery power requirements, noise all over the place, and not a predefined signal anywhere, high-resolution data converters have come to the rescue. Once upon a time, high-resolution data conversion was only a tool of precision test and measurement. But those days are long gone, aren't they? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In our IoT-connected world, high-resolution data conversion with advanced power management and multi-channel configurations are more important than ever before. In this episode of Chalk Talk, I sit down with David and Dean from Maxim Integrated, and we chat about the latest generation of data converters and how they can count even more jelly beans than ever before. <laughs> Wait, scratch that. How they can help resolve your signal issues in your next connected design. Yeah, you're still going to have to count those jelly beans yourself. <laughs> Let's go. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find more information about data converters from Maxim Integrated. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be on the show. Okay, so we're talking about high-resolution data converters today. But when I think of high-resolution data converters, I think of test and measurement. But we're getting into more than that today, right? Absolutely. Amelia, that's a great question. And we're seeing a lot of market drivers for this type of high-resolution data converter beyond the test and measurement space. And a lot of examples fall into what I call real-world types of variables for sensing. Things like temperature out in the environment, things like environmental mapping or seismic measurement, force and pressure and strain on things like bridges and buildings and other infrastructure. The difference between this type of sensing and other types of sensing is that you can't control the amount of noise or the input range of the signal. Sure. In addition, with these types of sensors, there is often a need for sporadic sensing. It's not a variable that's going to be sensed on a continuous basis. It may not necessarily change super rapidly. Yeah. And oftentimes, the types of sensors that are doing this sensing need to run from battery power. Sure. And you have a motivation to reduce the processing infrastructure that's behind them because out in the field, you don't have that entire computer and power and back end to do all of the signal processing. Absolutely. Okay, Dave, let's talk about those signals. Now, what about those known signals versus real world signals where we would not necessarily know what range we need, what noise is happening, the temperature? Yeah, exactly, Amelia. Really good question because 
a lot of the sensing that's done today with very good 12 and 16 bit types of data converters are done on expected signals. Imagine a process control application where okay. you're measuring the temperature of a boiler. You know what range that temperature is going to be in and probably some of the guard bands that that temperature range might deviate into. Sure. And you're going to be continuously monitoring that. On the flip side, real-world signals are going to come in in ranges that are not necessarily expected. You don't know what the magnitude of, say, an earthquake is going to be. Sure. And furthermore, they're going to have a lot of noise sources in them, right? Because right. the noise that's out there in the real world and the environment is something that simply can't be controlled. Yeah. So we see these types of signals in test and measurement, strain gauges, and environmental temperature sensing. Cool. Okay, so let's talk about applications. Now, what kind of real-world applications are you seeing today? So there's a lot of them, and they're shown here on the slide. Just to touch on them, predictive preventative maintenance is a big one in terms of gauging the lifetime and when maintenance needs to be done on certain equipment. Medical imaging is another important one where higher resolutions are allowing doctors to get richer diagnosis and clearer images of the types of things they're analyzing. Environmental mapping is critical, and this is done for exploration and mapping of geophysical features. Again, really, really low strength signals that need high resolution. Gaming and handhelds, where these customers want to provide a rich, immersive gaming experience that's got very good sensing of how much pressure a player may be putting on a button. Power grid requires very, very clear analysis of whatever current spikes or deviations may be going on in the power grid. Yeah. Material analysis and monitoring is another critical one, providing sure. better resolution and better analysis of critical materials. And, you know, this example is a great one here, landing gear on an airplane. Yes. <laughs> I think anybody that flies knows how critical that is. Absolutely. And then lastly, test and measurement. So a lot of applications. Okay, so Dave, how does resolution impact the signal itself? So resolution is really, really important, first and foremost, in terms of the accuracy that you can measure from a signal. And what we'll show here is a sine wave that you'd be measuring, and the black dot represents the point that you would actually take the measurement. And we know that our signal measurement is a construction of a series of points. The black lines provide sort of a guard band of where we know our measurement is going to be the accuracy of what we measure. And the resolution directly impacts that accuracy. Okay. So if we apply low resolution measurement to this signal, we know that our signal is going to be somewhere in this envelope defined by that gold sine wave. If we put a higher level resolution on, we see that that envelope shrinks and we have a better idea of what our actual signal is. And then if we put our highest resolution on there, we see that our gold envelope most accurately represents the signal that we're trying to measure. Right. Okay, so we've started way back at 12-bit data converters, right? But Dave, how have we gotten to 24-bit? What does that path look like? Yeah, the path has been a tremendous expansion in the resolution of data converters and the demand, the request from the global market for these devices mm -hmm. is has been growing and insatiable. When 12-bit converters first came out many, many years ago, they were applied to strain gauges and process control. And then 16-bit data converters came out, and those were applied to those same applications, especially ones that required higher accuracy, but new applications also like signal processing and communication. With 24-bit data converters, we continue to see the application of the data converters in those end markets, but also in more and more markets. Mm. As I mentioned earlier, advanced imaging, environmental sensing, as the performance of these data converters fits these applications. Okay, Dave, so what exactly does 24-bit bring to the party? What real benefits are we looking at here? So the real benefits with 24-bit come in the form of accuracy, linearity, and noise rejection. So if we take a little bit closer look at some of the key specifications for data converters, we can understand that better. 
And one specification we can look at is integral nonlinearity. And in a nutshell, integral nonlinearity defines the deviation of your measured signal from the ideal linear response of a data converter. Okay. So if you were to say draw a straight line from the lowest input to the highest input, that would be a purely linear response. And every data converter is going to deviate a little bit. Yeah. If we look at this chart here that we have on the left-hand side of a slide, this is INL, integral nonlinearity, for one of our 24-bit ADCs, the MAX 11254. Now, this is 24 bits. In the case of 16 bits, INL is measured in least significant bits. So for a 16-bit data converter, that's going to be about 1 in 65,000, you know, because you do 2 to the 16 for your 16-bit yeah. resolution. For 24 bits, it's measured in parts per million. Wow. And that's about an order of magnitude better. So you can envision how much better linearity you have in your data converter. Absolutely. The next variable that's cool to look at is signal to noise ratio. And this is a root mean squared ratio of the input signal to associated noise. And in the case of SNR, you remove some noise like harmonics and DC. There are other specifications like SINAD, which is signal to noise and distortion, or total harmonic distortion that bring in and exclude other variables. But from our perspective, signal to noise essentially communicates to you how well that data converter can identify the signal and reject associated noise. Ah, okay. Again, in the case of 16 bits, you're typically talking about 85 to 95 decibels. 24-bit data converters are much, much better with about 110 to 130. Wow. And if you see the chart here, this is the MAX 11040K. That's a 24-bit data converter, and we're seeing 117 dBs at a frequency of 1 kilohertz. So really, really good SNR. Oh, wow. Okay, so Dave, let's talk about that elephant in the room. Power management. <laughs> Great point. Great point. Like we talked about earlier with these sensors needing to operate from battery power, we've put some cool power management features into our next generation data converters. One is FIFO or a first in first out buffer. And the next is what we call conversion result processing. Okay. So Dave, FIFO has been around for a while, but we're looking at some really cool stuff in this realm, right? Exactly. FIFO has been around for a while and we're seeing new applications for it. The simple explanation of FIFO is that the measurements can be put into a buffer. And the example that I'm showing here is a, a 64 entry buffer in our MAX 11261. The benefit from a power management standpoint is that your digital processor only needs to wake up in one out of every 64 entries and can get a burst download of all of that data. So you save all of the energy of the microcontroller powering up and powering down or continuously operating during that entire time. Very cool. Okay. So that second bullet on your slide was conversion result processing. Now, I'm not sure what that is. Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a really exciting feature, one that I want to talk about. Basically, with conversion result processing, which we've implemented on our latest ADCs, we allow the user to only measure signals that are within or outside of their predefined levels or guard bands. Okay. So if we just look at this pictorially on the left, we see a signal and we see a signal chain there that's always measuring that signal. So you have to have a relatively large processor that's continuously measuring whatever signal comes from the sensor in the ADC and it's always processing it. In contrast, on the right, the signal measurement begins only after that teal signal comes up and above the upper red dashed line. Right, okay. So you're only measuring the signals that you want to measure or are important, and you're saving both the size and cost of the associated hardware, and you're saving the power because the digital processor only needs to turn on during those critical times. 
Right. Okay. So let's get into some real world examples as none of this is happening in a vacuum. (laughs) So a lot of IoT designs these days don't just have one sensor. They have a whole bunch of sensors. So have you seen anything in this realm? We certainly have. There's a lot of customers that are interested in putting multiple types of sensors, as you said, on the front end of their system. But they want to have as simple of a signal chain behind it as possible. Right. This case study identifies one of our parts that's a great product for this type of multi-sensor interface, and that's the MAX 11410. It's a 10-channel, 24-bit input part. And so it allows customers to put voltage or current measurement or thermocouple or, or whatever sort of sensor front end they want to put on it. It has other cool features like two output excitation current signals. So you can put a a resistance temperature detector on there that requires that current. And it has an integrated PGA. So depending on the size of those input signals, that value, that measured value can be scaled before you go ahead and convert it. So the real cool benefits of this part are the performance. It's got best-in-class noise rejection, the multiple inputs that allow a lot of sensor configurations, as we've talked about, and really, really low power consumption. Very cool. Okay, so Dave, way back in the beginning, you said gaming was one of your target applications. So tell me, what have you seen in this arena? Mm -hmm. Gaming, I mean, it's really fun, right? Who doesn't love to game? And we've had customers come to us who've said, we want to have force touch sensing on our gaming controllers. Cool. So that's going to add to the gamer's experience and going to be able to provide feedback as far as how much the gamer is pressing on their controller. And the Max 11261 is like the perfect data converter for that type of application. It's a six channel, 24 bit ADC. And this is the one that's equipped with the FIFO and the conversion result processing that we talked about. Okay. So, you know, if the gamer's not really pressing very hard or or not even pressing at all on the button, they want to ignore those signals and save the battery power. Sure. Because everybody uses a cordless gaming controller these days. In addition, this part has an integrated PGA for scaling those signals. It's super precise with SNR up to 119 decibels. The integration of all these features makes for a nice small solution and allows customers to reduce, again, that digital processing and hardware that's associated with the system. Very cool. Okay, so what about environmental sensors where power is at a premium and there is noise all over the place? Mm -hmm. There is so much noise in these environmental situations for sensing, and they've got to operate at really low power. When customers come to us for this application, the MAX 11214 is the ideal part here. This is a single channel input device, but it's equipped with the most advanced filters that we have. It runs as high as 140 decibels SNR, so our best performance from a noise perspective. Nice. And it goes down really, really low in power, only five milliwatts. So these sensors that are out in the wild can operate off of super, super tiny batteries and extend the life of those batteries as much as possible. Very cool. All right, Dave. Well, let's wrap up your main points for me real quick. Sure thing. In a nutshell, we're seeing a resolution revolution here with data converters. And 24 bits are leading the way with additional features that we're putting in our products to reduce processing, time and hardware, as well as power consumption to enable more mobile battery operated types of applications. And I would just encourage anybody that's watched this to go ahead and dig in a little bit more. There's a bunch of cool resources that we have on the website and we've got a variety of other products uh, that I think would be interesting. So come take a look at those and thank you so much. Really enjoyed this today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Dave. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find more information about data converters from Maxim Integrated. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal or check out YouTube, keyword EE Journal.